They don't say how long ago it was. What they do is they put events on a continuum from the beginning of time up to the present and put them in order. And this flute goes all the way back to the time of the eagle bone whistle. And that's how, where this comes from. So it's an old tradition. And I happened to see one of these flutes for the very first time in Oscar House studio. And I was so amazed by it. I was so interested in it. And he let me study it. And I drew it. And I measured it. And I looked at it. And I puzzled out how to make it. And just with a pocket knife and a piece of wood, I made my first flute. And where my cultural journey really began is my aunt Blossom. She was telling me, she said, one of my grandmother's cousins and his cousin, they made and played flutes when they were younger. And we should go talk to them. And that was Norman Blue and his cousin, David Marks. And from them, I learned songs, oral history, and the culture of the flute. And this began a cultural journey for me. And this is unique. It's different. Because there's flute players all over the United States. There's flute circles in every major city. There was a flute circle in Washington, D.C. And they call this the renaissance of the flute. It's a time when people are playing flutes all over the world. But none of them are traditional flute players. None of them know the culture about the flute. And so this is what's really made this special for me, is a cultural journey. And so without this tradition, without the culture, it might be something else. It might be a musical journey. It might be a social journey. But it won't be a cultural journey. So it's important to keep this tradition and to pass it on. In 1985, I was the first elementary certified teacher at the Chios Pazina Tribal School. And that was the first year the tribal school was uh, state certified also. And I played songs for the flute for my class. And eventually, a couple years later, I met Lee Gressip. He wanted to learn how to make flutes for his wood shop. And we turned it into a uh, yearly project. And every time he had flutes, I would go into his class and made sure they played and made sure they were tuned up. And he continued that. And I think I would guess he made close to a thousand flutes with the tribal students here at home to help this tradition to continue. In all the workshops I've done, in all the different places to make and play flutes in all the different places, I played flutes. And one of the most special times for me to play this flute is I used to like to get up early in the morning at Powell's where we're dancing. I used to think, uh, I used to get compliments from the campers and they could hear it and they could wake up to the sound of the flute. And so I was in a place in Nepal, and one of the places close by is green grass where the white buffalo camp, white is kept. And not far from there is Red Scaffold, and next to that is Cherry Creek. And so some of the most traditional people live in this area. And I was at a pow-wow, and I was playing the flute early in the morning. And just suddenly, seven old men came and sat down in a circle around me. And it was really nervous. I was really, uh, didn't know what to think. Nothing like that happened to me before. And all I could think is, I'm just going to sit here and play my, all my songs that I know I'm playing all in a row, and that's what I do. And when I was finished, they were all happy. They all shook my hand. And one of them I got to know later, Joe Flyby, he said, that's the way the flute is supposed to be played. 
And so this was kind of like my test. And since then, it's um, always been special for me to play these songs and to hear back from people uh, different things that they, they think and say. So I've done what I could to keep this 